It's great honour to have you back here, um, Sharon, with Timeless Textiles. This is your third time, Sylvia. What? I know. Can't believe it. Anyway, here I am. Thank you very much. So we've had quite a move in the last five years in your show, Sylvia. The first one was Camouflage. Um, the second was Ties That Bind, and here you are with Italian Art. Are you happy to talk a little bit about each of those exhibitions? Absolutely. Yeah. So should we start off with Camouflage? Well, Camouflage came from um, uh, a theme that I was working with my sister who was uh, living in Bangladesh at the time and had just embarked on a career or, you know, into visual arts having been a writer and uh, so to keep a bit of a continuum and to keep something fresh we decided to give each other a theme alternately uh, every two weeks and mine was camouflage this time and I knew that I was coming up for a show with you and I was down in the gallery in my studio working out how I might go about starting this so I thought I'd just make some felt because I'm a textile artist and primarily a uh, felt maker to be with. So I uh, laid some, some uh, work out on the table and then thinking where I might go with it and this fantastic image that my husband had taken of an Aboriginal woman that was very far off in the distance, so you couldn't see, it was just a silhouette of her standing there, and I just always, you know, loved this image. And the thought of camouflage came up, and the idea that these women are so strong, they're not seen, they're camouflage, we don't see them for who they are, as these, these strong women that, you know, have so much presence and history and culture behind. So I thought I'd use her. So I, I used just the silhouette of this woman and I repeated the image in many different forms and shapes. So that was the, the thrust of camouflage. The second one, the ties that bind, started from a piece of work that I had done using paper, lots of ink, uh, uh, the, the paper was very distressed in many ways. Then I sewed it all together to make a very, very large uh, curtain. There were probably 40 pieces of paper in that. And then uh, I sewed it all together. And then I had to also bring it together as well with uh, the, uh, an image over the top to pull it all together. So the term, the ties that bind came and then that's such a wonderful working title that I thought that I could probably extend that um, with uh, how you might think of the ties that bind in in the 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 way that our body works. And so then I got very uh, thought up, uh, looked at structures of cell formations and bones and movements of, of uh, veins. So I started to incorporate all of those into bits of textiles that I'd found that reminded me of certain things and brought this body of work together. And this one, this current one, uh, Italian Eye, I was very lucky to spend three months in Italy last year. And I didn't move around a lot and I really wanted to go there and just take it all in. So, uh, when I came back from that time, I was offered this uh, exhibition by you, and you wanted a title, and the only thing I could think of at the time was that I had to do something about my time in Italy, and so I called it Italian Eye. And from there it came that, you know, how was I going to work uh, a cohesive body of work around rather than doing all those beautiful Italian scenes. So I sat with it and thought, well, what was it that really, that really uh, found to me when I was in, in Italy? And to start off, it was the walls. So a lot of this work is about the walls to begin with. And then this remarkable thing happened where I noticed these 
this well, one dog in particular to begin with that was walking independently down the street in Venice. And this dog uh, just had this presence about him. He, he, he would stop, he would engage with people, but then he would just be quite independent in his purpose. So uh, I basically stalked him. <laughs> and then I noticed other dogs doing the same thing. So I, I took lots of images of these dogs and they attracted me. And at night, because I just had it on my mobile phone, I would draw the image from the phone. So I thought, I'm going to, because it was it caught my eye, it was what I was attracted to. And the other thing that I was really attracted to was the structural, uh, the, the striped buildings, the striped churches of Italy. And I love the, just the, the drawing element of them. You know, the paired back, you know, just black and white often, sometimes using another colour. So I decided to go with those. So that's where this work comes from. And how do you keep your eye in, Sylvia? By constantly looking. Uh, I think as an art student, when I first went to art school, I, you know, I was learning and then part of my, um, part of the course was to do photography. And I was given themes and so the first theme was taking pictures of shadows, to go out and find shadows. And the second one was reflections and so on. And after three or four months, I started to see things that I'd never seen before. I started to, uh, it was like this whole world opened up to me. So I'd be uh, walking down the street and a tile had come off the wall and where all the glue was left and had been weathered, there was this landscape and I saw it. And I saw the chemicals on a, on a bitumen road that uh, somebody had spilt, but the way that the light hit it, it was something else. I saw the mould that was on my bathroom roof as I lay in the bath <laughs> and thought, that's very beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Not <laughs> that's a clean drawing. <laughs> that's a drawing. Uh, things started to appear to me and, I, and it's never gone away. So I think in constantly looking being stimulated, uh, it, it, it's just, it's my world. So my eye is my world and, and how I translate that from what I see into my work is just by the doing and a lot of play. Some things don't work, some things do. I revisit things a lot and uh, I'm doing things all the time and I'm doing them not with any purpose sometimes, just for the doing. And that can be at night and it can be very small. And the other thing that I encourage lots of people, and it seems to be the, the difference, is that I never put things away. I live with what I'm doing at the time. So when you talk about those early days of training, it seems to me like that wasn't a one semester block of getting your eye into contrasts and tonal differences. That it sounded like it was months and months and months worth of training that you were doing. Yes, I went to, uh, my, my background, I was always somebody who drew as a, as a child. Uh, I drew on anything, much to the horror of many people. I, I would draw in people's novels at the front. <laughs> Uh, any piece of paper that I could find, I would draw and I'd make my stories up and I would draw. And so when it came time to, you know, as a very young person to think about what I was going to do, I thought art, but, you know, my family, mom, my mother thought, no money in art, you should go to nursing. So it wasn't until my, uh, I was independent and had travelled and come back that I decided that I would go to art school. So I went uh, to art school for three years and it's continued on. And I have uh, 
been involved with with art in many different forms. Sometimes low periods, but I've I've gone from um, doing wearable art, painting shoes, making jewellery for many years, felt making and making clothes, then to uh, drawing and painting. I did a a year in northern New South Wales of drawing for a whole year, which was a fantastic year, just to revisit being a student and to just focus on drawing, which is you know, one of my greatest loves. And then in the last 15 years, I've had the wonderful um, opportunity through my nursing background in mental health uh, and my arts background to uh, become a coordinator of an art program in a very large mental health facility in uh, Brisbane, in Queensland. So, yes, it's in my life all the time. Are there a few uh, books or um, other pieces of artwork that constantly inspire you, that draw you back into um, charging you or thinking of a new way of doing something if you were to get a block or hit against a wall? Uh, when I hit against a wall, I'll often turn to nature to, to inspire me back again. I'll go to art galleries. I always get uh, something out of going to see a show especially the big regional uh, and state galleries, you know, where you, you've got a lot. And I'll take my time, I'll spend a bit of time with s certain works, but I'll, that will often inspire me to get me going again. Reference books, I'll well, have the internet now, so you just need to Google textile art or something, and there, there, will, there will be a, a lot. There's some prominent artists that, Judy Watson, um, I, I love her mark making and her, her background. And where do you think you're going to head, Sylvia? Or is that one of those questions that's just too hard at this point in time, having spent two years pulling together this show? Where am I going to head? Well, it's, it's interesting. I think after you've been close with any body of work and it's finished and I've let go of this now and it will come back to lots of play again. I have, uh, uh, I will be teaching next year in America, so I, I will need to get some work together for that. And, you know, I think a lot of play, experimenting, I'm very much loving the, uh, the use of ink now, and I'm loving the, the textures and forms and where I might take that with with uh, textiles and paper and incorporating both. Look, I think just where I'm heading is that I hopefully just want to keep moving and rather than falling back, doing things that I've done before. There's always things that you have done before that you will incorporate into your work. But there's a, um, just, you must never think that, you, that you're there because that will be the story. What would be the uh, pieces of advice that you would give to other people about moving forward in the work that you're doing, be it young students or people who are just stepping into um, fibre art with some trepidation? Well, whether it be fibre art or, or any art, uh, you need to treat it with huge respect and look after your practice. Your head can get in the way and it can tell you that you're, uh, why am I doing this? You know, am I going to sell it? Is it going to be any good? Uh, how will people like it? There's all sorts of obstacles that will stop us. And so to treat it like some special fabulous gift that you've been given and look after it because it's only in the doing uh, the done is done but it's the doing where uh, 
something wonderful happens. And having just taught here for two days, and we talked about this a bit, and one of the students, uh, a woman from New Zealand, uh, said many, many years ago, uh, a teacher had said to her, there are three stages of art making. There is the, the first stage, which is the idea and the getting together of materials. There's the third stage, which is the end result. And there's the stage two, which is the doing, but it's also can be the desert. And it's a thing that, you know, you have to, there's struggle in there, there is angst, there's, all sorts of things, there's walls, huge boulders that you have to move, thinking that you're on top of the world and that you've almost got it, and, and that you're there, and then you might lose it at any point. And it's, it's all that stuff that goes, that is, it's where it's all at, it's the growth, it's the thing that moves you on. So look after it, that's what I would say, look after it. Beautiful point. Thank you very much. It's an absolute honour to have you show with Timeless Textiles. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you.